everyone. We're starting with um, this is the comparative law lecture on comparative legal reasoning. We're up to part D, logic and legal reasoning. And I want to start with some words that we lawyers often use, like obviously, you know, mathematical. We don't hear that that much, but um, deductive, we hear that a lot. Uh, valid. Um, but what do these words mean, obviously, clearly? I suggest to students in the tort and contract modules that they should try to avoid those words because when they, they're argumentative words and when we use them, sometimes we use them to mask things that are not obvious, right? Uh, and uh, so look at your usage when you're saying, because this is clearly this. Um, is clearly necessary. Usually it's not. And more importantly, are you using it clearly when it's not clear? Are you trying to, right, just sort of move past that point? So uh, mathematical deductive, we use that. Excuse me, I've um, been drinking um, sparkling water. Okay. I know it's impolite, sorry. Um, deductive valid. What, um, what lawyers are really saying, we're, we're saying is something, well, oh, I deduce this, or this is obvious. Um, they're saying that something's convincing, maybe coherent, uh, reasonable, is when we use so much in, in um, English. It's, it's really, it's not logical, right? Not logical, right? I mean, it's unreasonable. It's... Um, maybe capricious, um, but we're using some of these words that are also used in classical logical reasoning, but we're using them differently. Now, in classical um, logical reasoning, uh, the word deductive reasoning or deductive logic is reasoning from general premises to particular results. And this is something that a lot of authors dwell upon, that, that this is how people think on the continent, uh, continental Europeans, in contrast to English lawyers, and those American lawyers, and Aussie lawyers, and etc., um, who are thinking some other way, uh, by analogy, they usually say. Now, so let's look at this claim that lawyers are thinking deductively. But before we can do that, we have to define what it really means in classical legal reason, classical lo reasoning of logic, okay, logical reasoning. And um, you have to start off from a statement, a premise that is accepted as true. And the premise doesn't have to be true. It just it is accepted as true. And then you apply that to a new situation. For example, this is one that's used a lot. If all cats have fleas, that's the major premise. Now, we know that's not true. Um, and princess is a cat. You look at her, okay, from one side or the other. Yeah, turn her around, looks like a cat to me. Well, then you know she has fleas, right? So that result is logically valid, but in fact, it's not true. I mean, it might be true for this particular cat, princess, but if we looked at enough cats, we'd uh, find out that there are some cats without fleas. Okay. So, um, one problem, another problem with that, with logical reasoning applied to law, is that um, um, it's circular reasoning that you've decided, you've already chosen the premise that you're going to apply. Right? Now, inductive reasoning, the idea is that you have some facts out there and you try to tie them together, right, and, and, and pull a conclusion out of them. And so you're reasoning from the general and making it more particular or bringing it together. So if you examine a thousand cats and you find they all have fleas, then you might uh, come up with the, uh, the result. Uh, the induction, it would be called, is, you know, that all cats have fleas. Now, 
Sherlock Holmes and others um, called, uh, Conan Doyle, called that deduction, I have deduced. And that's one of the complications in this area, is we use the words inconsistently. According to logical reasoning, that would be an induction, right? Because these are the facts, and you induce something. Okay. Uh, look, I like Sherlock Holmes. I'm not criticizing this. I'm just telling you that this complicates our work here as lawyers. So, um, inductive reasoning, which is sometimes poo-pooed, um, is extremely powerful. Um, basically, all of the empirical sciences employ that method. Right? So, they'll run an experiment, and they'll run it a hundred times, and then they'll say, I'm not going to run it one more time, because I've proven that if I, the hundred first time will be exactly the same. Right? They're not deducing anything from some overriding principle. They're inducing. And the same thing from running these experiments. Right? They're saying it's going to be the same next time. It's an induction. Very powerful. And logical reasoning, analogies are like everything. Okay? Uh, it's very hard to uh, dispute someone who says, well, I'm reasoning by analogy. Well, okay, maybe we all are. Um, it's, that's why some uh, people say it's not a separate style of reasoning, it's kind of inductive reasoning. Anything that's not deductive is by analogy or induction. Um, but they're very persuasive. For example, if people are mortal and people are mammals, then you might think that other mammals like cows, gerbils, and whatever, uh, they're also mortal, right? That would be an induction by analogy. And uh, these are very persuasive, and um, the problem is finding something that connects these two animals. And I said here they're both mammals, right? Um, but how about four-legged animals? Yeah, I think they all die too, but um, they're not all four-legged animals are, are mammals. So um, that's the problem with making analogies, is that you have to find a rule in law that is kind of, is, it cl is in a different area, but it's kind of close to your area, okay? That is um, what you have to do. And then the idea in your head is there's some principle that connects these. There's some reason that you're connecting them. For example, all mammals um, are mortal. It's easier to do this by an illustration. And I'm giving you one from Germany here. Now, I had to translate this again. Uh, so I apologize, um, but this is basically what this this provision of the German Civil Code says. If the marriage does not take place, ah, I told you my quote was was from California, but I think this is it. Sorry, but it's still a statute. Um, California has a statute like this too. If the marriage does not take place, each engaged person may require the other to return what the former gave as a present or as a sign of the engagement. Okay? That's, uh, unter bleibt die Erschließung. That's, uh, okay. Yeah. That's what it says. That's actually a pretty good translation. So, does this apply to gifts by the families? Now, let's read it again. If the marriage does not take place, okay, each engaged person, doesn't say, doesn't say it applies to families, does it? Uh-uh. If you just look at the text, you'd say it doesn't apply to families. But is there something similar if you wanted it to apply to families? Something similar between the engaged person and the family? Yeah, you know, they're very, it's part of the, the people are going to get married into the family and um, they have, um, and another similarity will be they will have given gifts maybe even worth more 
than what the engaged people themselves exchanged. That's a pretty close analogy. How about gifts by friends of the family? Can you do that by analogy? Right? Or is it some kind of deduction? You're saying we're going to redefine the word engaged person. Um, that's jeder Verlobte in German. Each engaged person to extend to mean engaged person and yeah, you see where I'm going with this. Um, I think, which is, um, what's logic got to do with this? Um, that doesn't help us um, either one way or the other. We're not worried about logic when we're trying to decide this case here. Right? We're thinking more about would it be fair? Is Maybe is this what the drafters of the um, German Civil Code were thinking? Um, is the purpose really to protect the finances of these people, in which case you could e extend it to the uh, parents? Is the purpose really to uh, protect the, the effects of being engaged? In other words, like a contract and people affected by that, well then it might extend out, you see, uh, to a little farther. Um, the friends of the family that gave gifts, right? It's, uh, okay, that's, um, that's not um, classical logic. Here's one. A, I had never heard this word mandatory before, um, but I read this, Beauftragte um, is in German. If a, the mandatory, that is someone who does not um, work for money. So a person who's a volunteer doing it for a friend or something. Um, if the mandatory, uh, for the purpose of performing the mandate, for example, you're carrying a fish tank for your friend uh, to her new um, flat, uh, down at the end of the block, okay? Uh, if the mandatory uh, incurs expenses that he may consider to be necessary in the circumstances, the mandator is obliged to make reimbursement. Well, maybe along the way, she's doing this and she's worried that the water's starting to get warm on this very hot day, or maybe it's very cold, and it's getting cold, and she sees someone coming by with a wagon and says, say, um, can you take uh, take this along um, with you on your wagon? Because i got to get, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be fast enough and this fish is going to die. Um, or bake or cook or something. And uh, the person says, well, how much money do you have? How about a fiber? You say, okay. Five pounds. It's all done, everything. The first thing that helps you take it upstairs. This statute says, if you're in Germany, you can um, have a right to recover that. But by the way, that's a very simple example. We're talking about people incurring more expenses, usually. So, the question is, what if, in the process of carrying your fish tank, your friend drops it and it breaks? Is that an expense that she considers necessary in the circumstances? Well, it's necessary to replace it. Um, is that part of the mandate to break it? Well, no, but it's incidental, you see? That process of deciding that, is that the logical legal process? Could you do it by analogy? Because the loss suffered in the first one was five pounds, and the loss suffered here, let's say, is a hundred pounds. So she suffered loss in both of them. So maybe it extends to that. How about does it apply to employees? Now remember, the mandatory is someone who is working for free. 
and employees are working for money. And there's a separate statute for employees, and it doesn't say this. There's no statute that says this for employees. How would you allow an employee to recover? I think I can tell you about this story without offending anyone who plays viola. A man who played viola in a city orchestra was at the, uh, uh, whatever you call it, what's it called, the, the, the uh, building, the, uh, um, I can't even think, a theater where the orchestra performs. He was in one of the practice rooms uh, with his viola, and he put his bow in his left hand for some reason, maybe to, doesn't say, to turn the music, and he flicked his wrist, the tip of the bow hit the wall, concrete wall, snapped off. And this was a very expensive bow that it w was on loan from a store. And um, on loan because he was looking at buying it, but then after he broke it, he said, well, I sure don't want to buy it, okay? And he goes back to the store and he said, well, hey, you own it now. We'll try to fix it, but you can't really. But you, you bought yourself a bow, buddy. Uh, he turns around to his employer, the uh, city of, I forget, Mannheim or something in Germany, and says, could you please reimburse this? You probably have insurance, because I don't. I mean, who has insurance for breaking a viola bow? And the employer said, no, we're not going to pay for this. It's your own darn fault. So the employer went to court, and he won. There's no statute allowing him to recover. There's nothing that the employer did wrong. The employer even supplied a practice room. There was nothing wrong with the practice room. There was nothing wrong with the wall. This was the fault, if anything, of the, um, the viola player himself. So how do you justify that? And the German court said, well, we'll use an analogy to the statute right here. Well, the statute doesn't apply. Well, let's just call it an analogy because it's kind of like this. That's what analogical reasoning and law is. It's kind of like this situation where somebody's working for free, except pretend this person wasn't working for free. Pretend he was getting money, but then he suffers um, a loss. Like, like the uh, woman who was helping her friend move and drop the fish tank, and we let her recover. So let's sit this guy. You know, he plays viola. I mean, you got to feel sorry for him, right? I'm being facetious. Okay. That's an analogy in law. So, uh, what uh, analogies are not unknown in the common law world, but if we use this narrow definition of analogy and not just say analogy is like anything, right? Everything is an analogy. Um, we can find some analogies. In the olden days, they're really, really hard to find today. In fact, I've never found any true analogy in England or the United States, a statutory analogy in this way they're used in Germany. And it's actually quite common in Germany. Now, but let's look in uh, England, but we have to go back a few centuries, so stick with me, where there was a writ system. And that meant that the king's uh, judges could only decide a certain number of cases. There were roughly 40 to 75 common law writs. 40 to 75, they varied. They got more through the centuries, and then it was stopped at 75. And when you went to court, it was like claims. There were only 75 different claims that could be made to the king's court. Now, there were other courts for commercial matters, for, but we're talking about the major system of um, justice that is the forerunner of our courts today, so by far the most important courts. And these 40 to 75 forms of action were written in Latin, and um, today, we would describe them as statutes. That if this happens to you, you're allowed to recover. Let me give you an example of one or two. Here we got three. Uh, there, are, uh, there were writs for 
trespass viet armis et contra patrum domini regis, or regis, so that's with force and arms, okay, viet armis, like an army, and against the peace of the king, the Lord King. Uh, that was one. So if you could, um, you could allege that, and then you had to prove that, and if you prove that, then you'd recover. Uh, or trespass de bonus asportatis, the, for goods carried away, away, uh, quare clausum fregit, or fregit, whereby he broke the clothes, unlawful entry onto premises. These were the, you would say today, one who unlawfully uses force and thereby injures the personal property of another shall pay that person compensation and trespass, okay? In fact, um, in the California Civil Code, some of these are, are in there in English, of course, turned around as remedial statutes. Now, let's uh, go keep back. We're still back in the days uh, of these writs and in the, de in the decades and centuries when these writs were used. And we bring a writ of tres trespass, which is this one, viet armes et uh, contra pacem. Okay? So, uh, it's we say this, it's, um, you have to prove they've been injured in his personal property by an act of violence, Viet armies, right? So, uh, swords. Uh, and in fact, in the early days, that was um, common. That's why there's this writ, okay? So, case number one, um, while treating a horse's injured hoof, a farrier, that's a man that we shoes uh, horses. I didn't know that, but it's fair here. Injured the soft tissue inside the hoof, which caused the horse to go lame. The court ruled for the owner of the horse. So in that case, the court is deciding that a person injured, who did the injury, was a farrier who is using a knife like this inside the horse's hoof, okay? Uh, trimming the, the hoof on the outside and the inside here. And that frog was injured, that soft tissue, by the negligence here. Does that sound like it's an act of violence, viet Um The court ruled that it was. Now that is a shift away from intentional coming in with swords, right, to negligent injury. Now let's look at the next case. The animal is a zebra, or zebra, not a horse. And zebras and horses are single-hoofed animals. How do you find in the second case? Okay? There's two uh, right answers to this. You could say... The overriding principle is that single-hoofed animals are to be treated alike when determining whether a farrier who injures soft tissue inside the hoof is committing an act of violence under the writ of trespass. Okay, I just read that there. You could say that. Would that be analogous or deduction? Well, we'd probably say, oh, yeah, it's just analogous. It's kind of like a horse. It was basically a horse. Is not zebras just horses, right? It's, you know, they're the same. But, if you are a continental European lawyer, you'd say, wait a minute, you're applying this rule here deductively. You're defining, first of all, there has to be an injury, we know that, it's to your, to your um, property, your horse. And was it by an uh, act of, uh, uh, of an army, like an act of violence? Yes, it was. You see? So that, under that rationale, you're applying this rule deductively, like you did the first time. See, once you've decided, deduction works like this, once you've decided that there's been a damage to personal property, and that it was done via um, or as an act of violence, then you say, okay, there's recovery by this person. You see how you can, you can call this Deductive reasoning or analogical reasoning in English would almost say, well, it's by analogy. But if I were teaching you in Germany, 
in German, I would say we were applying this statute here in a deductive way, and this would be persuasive. The horse was already, you know, was, would help you decide that, that this is a correct answer. So, um, they in Germany, less so in Sweden, other places on the continent, uh, much more so than uh, Scandinavia, they um, talk a lot about the syllogism. They call it subsumption, subsumption in German, that you subsume the facts under the law. That is simply applying the law to the facts. It's exactly the same thing. I now am going to... Um, yeah, here's some, some soon, okay. Um, show you this. Um, I'm going back to Germany for this one, German Penal Code. Whoever takes personal property not his own from another with the intent of unlawful appropriating the pro property for himself <coughs> or for a third person shall be punished with imprisonment, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, it has to be personal property, did not belong to the accused, number two, appropriated by the accused for herself or another person, unlawfully, right? Who takes personal property not his own with the intent unlawfully appropriating, okay? Those are the four elements. So, let's uh, put on our uh, legal thinking caps. Anya takes a pair of sunglasses they do not belong to her. I tell you this, okay? Because the statute says property not his own. So these are not Anya's sunglasses. They're on a store rack. She's in the store, takes them off, maybe tries them on, drops them into her purse, leaves the store. Outside the store, she puts them on. And then I tell you, but don't I give you this? Um, yeah, that she's going to the beach. She plans to go to the beach. Okay? Now, I made this easy. It, sunglasses are personal property. I told you they do not belong to her. Did she appropriate them for her own use? Yes, I tell you that. Put someone so she can go to the beach with them. Uh, was it done unlawfully? Well, she didn't pay for them. I mean, she didn't have any legal justification, um, like necessity or something. Right. So she'd be found guilty, right? So, um, in other words, activity of subsuming means testing a logical way, this is called, whether the other elements have been met. Exactly, okay? Um, that's logical, you could say. But notice that you have to decide each of these elements, and deciding those is not logical. The logical thing about it is that after you said yes, in German they'll put a plus next to each one of these, to all of these, then you say guilty. Okay? That's the logical part. Let's look at here. Give you a few more. This will uh, sh illustrate what I'm trying to explain here. Now, here's a statute on manslaughter in Germany. Whoever kills a human being without being guilty of murder shall be punished for manslaughter with imprisonment for not less than five years. Okay, what is the crime of manslaughter? There has to be killing of a human being without possessing the prerequisites for the crime of murder, okay? So killing of a human being. Pretty easy. So let's look at this. Now, I have to tell you, I'm going to give you an example of an abortion just because uh, it presents a good... Um, good illustration of what I'm trying to show you. And what I'm trying to show you is that this is not a classical logical process. This is legal reasoning, which is not the same by any means. So, here's this uh, hypothetical factual situation number one. We also have a hypothetical factual situation number two. But here's number one. Tanya performs an abortion on Anya. Okay? Now, in fact, um, uh, there's a separate statute on abortion that, that uh, makes it criminal in certain cases. But we're not talking about uh, 218, we're talking about this one. So, um, the question is, is an abortion a killing? 
Okay? Does it matter if the fetus is old enough to survive outside the womb? Uh, is the fetus a human being? Does it matter if the abortion is performed after Anya goes into labor? Do Tanya's motives for the abortion matter? It might, if it's a killing, right? It might be murder. If Tanya is not a physician, can she s said to be acting for base motives? That's Let's back up the slide before. Um, proof of base motives is for murder. Okay. How do you answer? How do you, oops, I didn't mean to do this. How do you answer these, these questions? Is an abortion a killing? You see, we're supposed to be doing this deductively. But deduction doesn't help us. Deduction helps us after we've decided that abortion is a killing, yes or no. We could discuss this if this were a live lecture. And is a fetus a human being? Many people say yes. Um, if they say yes, then they say it's a killing. Right? If they say, well, not really, maybe it is later on, well, then, some point later on, it becomes a killing. Everyone would agree that after the child is born, killing is murder or manslaughter. The point I'm making is not that this problem is confined to abortions. The point I'm making is that this is always what we're doing in law. We're always dealing with, with cases but we have to find the facts and do they meet the, the um, requirements of the rule, whether the rule is from a statute or from the case. This is what we as lawyers are always doing. Let me give you another one. This Tanya really gets around. Tanya's mother lies in coma, in a coma. The brain scan confirms that her mother is brain dead, is what we read, right? That's not a medical term, but, um, well, maybe it's a medical term, I don't know, but her, what, it's, it's not accurate because her heart is still beating and she's breathing, uh, which means that the brain stem, right, uh, isn't dead. What it means is that the cortex, right, cognitive cortex isn't functioning. So Tanya can't take it anymore. Uh, she removes the feeding tube. And he goes through their nose. And intravenous apparatus for administering liquid. Okay. And I write, her mother dies. Well, or was she dead already? So, is it a killing? Well, she was breathing. Her heart was beating before then. Uh, but if she's brain dead, is she a human being? You see, now I'm not telling you this because it's upsetting. I think it is upsetting, but I'm telling you that this is what is going on when people, lawyers, judges, uh, are applying the law to the facts. This is not a logical process, right? You could call it maybe as an analogical. You could be thinking, well, it doesn't matter how long she's been... Uh, in this condition, or in the, the, the fetus, how far along, okay. That's kind of analogical, I'll give you that. But why are we even using words like that from, from cl a classical logic? Because this is not the same exercise. Whew. I think what I'll do is um, keep going with this, even though it got a little bit heavy there. We're going to stick with murder. And show you, here's a difference. I told you that legal reasoning is the same, but of course, how you talk about it and the rules that you use in legal reasoning are different. So let's look at this. Here's the present definition of murder on the left in the UK. It's actually not directly from a case, but uh, Sir Edward Cook.
Cook, I think it's pronounced, um, wrote his institutes based on case law and statute law at the time. Murder is when a man of sound memory, it includes women, okay, and of the age of discretion, unlawfully killeth within any county of the realm. That has been widened by statute to mean uh, to be any place in the world. Any reasonable creature in rerum natura, so a human being, under the king's peace, uh, under the jurisdiction of the, the king, with malice of forethought, um, either expressed by the party or implied by law, so the party wounded or hurt, etc., die of the wounded, etc., blah, 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 constitutes murder. Uh, Cal California Penal Code says murder is the unlawful killing of a human being or a fetus. It tells us, okay? It tells us. Okay, unlawful killing of a fetus. Now, abortion is legal in California under certain circumstances. But if it's not done under certain circumstances, it constitutes murder, or can constitute. Now, notice that this is partially this uh, the British law, a product of common law, judge-made law, and statute, because this has been changed about um, happening in uh, uh, under the king's peace. Can also that would mean inside the UK, but it can also be murder if if uh, it's someone is uh, killed outside the UK. And there's no limitation over here. And this is statute. But let me tell you that this unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought, that is taken from the common law. That is here. He's going to unlawfully kill us, blah, 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 with malice forethought, you see? That's where the statute, the people drafting the statute got this definition. And um, here's another little illustration of this, that, that these rules can come from uh, statutes and from case law. Here's the UK Consumer Protection Act, um, where any damage is caused wholly or partly by a defect in a product, every person to whom subsection 2 below applies shall be liable for the damage. That's the Consumer Protection Act. We, I mentioned that earlier on in part 1. And here's the restatement of torts in the United States. One who sells any product in a de detective, defective condition, blah, blah, blah. This is basically the same as this. This restatement isn't a statute, it looks like one, but in the United States, academics, uh, lawyers, and some judges get together and draft these things of what they think the general law in the United States is. Some states have, have actually enacted this, uh, but it hasn't been enacted in California, and um, some states, the judges follow this definition. In California, the courts have come up with their own definition that I gave you earlier. So the source of uh, the rule here uh, can be statute, case-based, or both. All right. Now we're looking at the uh, the fun stuff. So I'm going to finish up. This is what you've been waiting for on this lecture. All right. So unfortunately, those scholars who describe the application of the law of the facts as inductive, analogical, or something else. Um, almost invariably are found in common law jurisdictions. It might be more accurate than what I'm going to show you in the next uh, paragraph um, because it's kind of this described as, well, it's kind of a free-for-all. Um, I think that's way too vague. And that's why I'm writing a book on this topic, okay? That's way too vague. It says, ah, oh, just kind of analogical. It's kind of what makes you feel good type of thing, okay? German and other continental scholars, while recognizing the differences from deductive logic, consistently describe the use of the legal syllogism as deductive. So they're convinced, well, not all of them, but very, very uh, large uh, number of them, if not most, uh, convinced that this is a deductive process. Well, it depends on how you define deductive, but it's not deductive in the sense of, of, um, uh, of um, classical logic. Uh, I mean, it, it might in its form. However, the real work that's being done is not the 
deductive part. It's, it's uh, fashioning, deciding which facts meet the definitions. That's, that's the real work of a lawyer. So it ends up, and I'll give you some illustrations here, with some pretty, similar, pretty silly sometimes um, misunderstandings uh, that people have. And um, let me start by telling you this little story. Um, and now I'll give you these quotes. Um, at a conference in, in Germany, where I used to teach, um, we had some uh, academics from England. Do we have judges there too? Yeah, these are some academics from England, and including Ibbotson, who was then, I think, is a professor at um, at uh, Cambridge now. He was at Oxford bef at the time, and um, and it was conducted in English. And this one German professor um, did some really interesting research comparing the the um, statements of law. They call them Rechtsätze. Um, in Germany, the German courts, with the English courts on, on similar areas of law. And um, maybe I'll tell you the rest of the story uh, in person, because I don't want this to be recorded, okay? So remind me uh, where, where I was starting off with this, okay? And, um, and, and ended up um, saying something, or maybe I have some, uh, something else that she wrote here. Yeah, I do. Okay, okay. This is good. Okay. Um, I forgot that I put this in there. And ended up saying something that that was just not true. Okay? And she asked for comments, and my colleague said, Oh, Herr Lundmark, you want to say something to, you know, say, you know, he wants me to participate. So I told her I didn't think that was true. And then she shifted over to tell me it in German. Um, and um, I told her, yeah, but that, that isn't how it works in England. And, um, and she said, well, that, that is how it works in England. That, that, uh, I maybe know about American law, but uh, I don't know about English law. And then Ibbotson piped up and says, no, it's the same in, in, in England, too. Um, so, um, and then we went uh, out to eat, and I ended up at the end of the table with her uh, right next to me. And I said, I say, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I hope you didn't mind me asking a question. Um, and I, maybe we can discuss it. And she said, oh, you have your opinion and I have mine. And she turned her back to me for the rest of the evening, okay? So <laughs> that's, that's why I remember this uh, pretty dramatically, okay? Um, now, she did change her name after that, but not as a result of that. It was, it was a result of her getting married, okay? But let me show you these quotations, and then you'll be able based on what we've discussed so far, to point out the fallacies involved here. Now, here's one uh, from a book, I think. Yeah. Um. Oh, no. This is actually from the court, the European Court of uh, Human Rights, a judgment there. The starting point for the thinking of continental jurists is deductive. Okay, starting point. Okay, well, let's see where he's starting now. They begin with an abstract legal rule. Now, let me stop everybody right here, okay? Remember, before you can get the abstract legal, first you get the rule, you have to do this Normsuche. So you have to find it first. Okay, that's actually, you don't, the starting point isn't the rule, it's finding the rule. But that's a minor criticism, I would say, on my part. And then he is argumentative. He says abstract legal rule. Well, why does it have to be abstract? Many legal rules are extremely concrete, right? But I'll give him that. They begin with an abstract legal rule and examine whether the facts of the case fulfill the statutory elements. That's accurate, okay? Quotation number two, part two. He goes on in the next sentence. The starting point for the thinking of English jurists is induction. Oh, wait a minute. Where's the English jurist starting? Okay? Uh, do, doesn't he have the rule? 
They begin with the facts of the case and compare them with the facts of other cases decided in the past. Oh, wait a minute. The continental jurist started with the facts. Remember I told you he got, he did the Normsuche, he found the rule. You cannot find the rule unless you know what the facts are, okay? So, this guy's a judge. Um, the starting point, and number one, was the Normsuche. He started with the facts and found the rule, okay? And this poor English jurist, I mean, I don't know who is he talking about. It can't be me. I have never met this judge. And I'm not English. I mean, some English jurist that he met thinks that what the guy does is gets the facts of the case, and then instead of looking for the rule, like the continental the European who is doing the Normsuche, this poor son of a gun is running up and down looking for cases decided in the past. Of course, you can't look for ones just out in the future. Uh, and say, okay, is this kind of like this or this kind of like this or this kind of... What does he think? I mean, this is how... <coughs> Jeez. Um, no, how does this work? Okay, now... Um, yeah, that just can't... That just can't work. Um, <coughs> what he's doing when he's finding the rule in the Normsuche, He's finding a, ru uh, uh, a, a norm, right, a rule that is comparable to the facts that he has. And that's what the English lawyer is doing, is looking for a rule that is comparable to the facts that he has. It's the same. Whew. European Court of Human Rights, judicial decisions are rendered through a logical syllogism in which, okay, don't read this part here. Let me see, I can black this out. Can I do that? And don't, oh, don't, don't read this part here. Now you're going to read it because I'm highlighting it, but I don't want to. <coughs> so, judicial decisions are rendered through a logical syllogism in which the judge selects a major premise, the norm or the, norm or the applicable case, so that's good, depending on how he or she initially perceives the facts. That is accurate. Uh, well, when he says the norm or the applicable case, continental Europeans use the word norm just for statutory norms. I use it to mean rules from any source. Specifically, we're talking about rules from statutes and rules from case decisions, but you can take rules from other sources as well, um, like Sharia you know, sources and um, the Bible, if you want. And Okay, but he's right in saying this. You select a major premise, that's true, the norm, and he's in the applicable case that has a ratio, right? Depending on how he or she initially perceives the facts. That's true because you might find out that the facts fit some other, you should have used some other rule. Okay, but now look what he writes in uh, quotation marks. Or in the common law tradition through stare decisis analogy. Wait a minute. So, whereas the continental uh, judge is logical and, um, you know, follows this logical uh, syllogism, right, mathematical precision. This poor common law judge, I mean, there's only judges from the UK, or were, and from Ireland. So these poor guys are in the pub someplace who are just downing beer after beer because they can't find any analogous cases, I guess. He's, how, you know, how did they even get to a point of the court? I mean, Makes it sound like they're just totally, uh, they're total fools. Um, if you notice, I'm kind of taking this personally. I am, all right? Uh, now, here's another one. Continental European legal thinking is deductive. It subsumes the case under the general rule. Common law thinking is inductive. It deri derives the rule by carefully interpreting the case. Well, listen. Ordinarily, you don't have to carefully interpret a case. You just take the ratio. The judges tell you that. And in German, it's called Rechtssatz. Rechtssatz, okay? And, it, and they put it at the front of the case. If you just pick up a case and uh, read it, the same. As in England, you not have to carefully uh, interpret a case to induce you know, the rule. Well, you can sometimes restate it, but you can do that with statutes too. 
So this poor, um, poor guy over, common law lawyer, including me, um, I, ha I, I can't even get to deduct it because I'm stuck out here someplace in the woods uh, trying to find a case of, tacked to a tree. I don't know how he's supposed to do this. So let me get, um, I think this is the one I wanted, uh, wanted to share with you. This is, <laughs> oh man, don't pass this on to people, okay, because they might figure out who I'm talking about. This is actually from an article by this professor I mentioned, Statements of Operative Facts by the Deductively Thinking Continental European Judges. Okay, now I translated this from German. Statements of Operative Facts, okay? So what she's saying is that she's comparing these Reichsdätze in, in Germany in a certain area of law with the ratios um, in England in this certain area of law and the, that are articulated by the courts, okay? The Reichsdätze, as I told you, they're put at the beginning of the judgments or sometimes in the case. You find them in the commentaries. Uh, England, you find the head notes will have the statements of law, the ratios are in the case. You'll find them in Halsbury's and practice books and, yeah, our, our textbooks. And, and she's saying that these are expressed in fairly general terms. So she said, uh, their level, the next uh, sentence, their level of generality is consistent with that of the raciones decidendi of the induct, okay, of, of the leading cases. In other words, the German judges are stating their ratios, their, okay? Um, I translated her words. She said statements of operative facts. She didn't say rechsetze, but that's what she means. These statements of the rule in German courts and in, in the statements of the rules in English courts are uh, consistent in their generality, in their abstractness, right? They are the, the same level of abstraction, of generality. Got me? Okay. Now, all that, I, I'm thinking, this, this is a great study. I mean, this is what I would have pre predicted, but it's good that someone has figured this out. And then she says this. Statements of operative facts by the deductively thinking continental European judges who are deciding cases beyond the law, preto legem. Okay? Now, certain areas of German law, quite a few of them actually, in certain, those areas there are no statutes. Okay? Sometimes what they'll try to do is take an analogy and stuff like that. But when analogies fail, there's just no statutes, there's only case law. Are you with me, okay? That is called preta legem, beyond the law. Oh, yeah. Another way, yeah, it's the best way to think of it. It's beyond the statutes. There's no statutes, okay? Now, she's literally stating and saying st these ratios that these judges in Germany are um, articulating, that the, the judges in Germany are thinking deductively. You got me? In areas where there's no statute law, these German judges are thinking deductively. Whereas in England, where there's no statute law, these poor English judges are thinking inductively. Give me a break. If there's no statutes, right? What are you deducing from? Do, does anybody share my wonderment here? And that's what I was asking her. How can you be deductively thinking when there's nothing to deduce from? You know, you can argue that, look, if you have a statute that you're using deduction. But we have no statutes. This is by definition preta legum. Well, what are you deducing from? Give me a break. I mean, what can they be doing differently? And the answer is they cannot be doing something differently. And if you think I am exaggerating this, I am not. All right? I'll tell you one last story. This happens to be another woman, and that's, there's no particular reason for that. Uh, 
Th this woman, I think, is quite brilliant. Uh, last time I talked to her, she was teaching in Sweden. She's German. She did a PhD at Stanford. Don't try to look her up either, okay? Um, and at the end of a talk that she gave in Germany, in a lecture of one of my colleagues, um, she outlined the research that she had done uh, for her PhD. And what she had done is interview judges uh, it, on the European Court of Justice and also the, the um, uh, Human Rights Court in Strasbourg and also analyzed their uh, judgments, okay? I came up with some fascinating, fascinating things that uh, we could talk about another time, I think. I feel like I'm running out of time here, but, uh, but what she said at the end was she noted that um, this um, Judge Jäger, Renate Jäger, the German judge, on the, on the uh, European Human Rights Court had just been appointed to the German Federal Constitutional Court. And at the end of her talk, uh, she said she had interviewed uh, Judge Jäger, we'll call her, at the Human Rights Court in, the, um, um, in Strasbourg. Uh, where they're dealing with human, just human rights, right? That is what is divine the human, U European Human Rights Convention. And moving across, literally across the Rhine to Karlsruhe and a little bit farther south, okay? Karlsruhe, where the German Federal Constitutional Court sits. And she said at the end of her presentation, she'd be fascinated to see how Judge Jäger, who was in this more like common law, uh, atmosphere of the um, Human Rights Court is doing when she goes to the German Federal Constitutional Court where it's all uh, statute-based uh, law. And um, afterwards, we uh, had lunch and she went back home, I think, uh, and I was talking to my colleague, and I said, um, hey, what do you think about that statement at the end? And he said, what the uh, Jäger, what this Rati Jäger is doing in Karlsruhe is exactly the same as what she was doing in, in Strasbourg. And uh, I said, I know, <laughs> he said, I said, you know that, I know that. Uh, well, why doesn't she know that? And he said, oh, it's some kind of, you know, th she's kind of a uh, theorist or something. And I said, I'm the theorist, okay? Okay. <laughs> this is... And, and I know this, and how can you not know this? And in fairness to these people, the ones that I've talked about um, and cited here, it's because they have heard this, and then they go around and they see it. They think they see it because someone has told them this or they've read it someplace. I think it might even be Weber who came up with this first, but let's not talk about that. So but they got this in their heads, so this is really uh, crucial in comparative law that when you go into something with preconceptions, you're going to find it. Like I think Abraham Lincoln said, if you're looking for the bad in someone else, you're surely going to find it. Okay? And it's a problem in comparative law that if we've learned about this other jurisdiction, then we tend to see things from the perspective of things that we have learned. And often those things are wrong. Okay? And this is one that's hugely wrong. I think I can end on this um, nice little quotation here, also a translation from uh, German. Analogy is the traditional kind of thinking in the precedentially determined common law. To say that the common law proceeds analogically is a cliché. Well, it might be a criticism, but I think he means in this book, it's everybody knows that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. No further comments. Hope you've enjoyed this. I have. And um, hope to see you.
online or in, actually in class soon. Okay, bye-bye.